45 centuries ago, in the desert outside what is now Cairo, one of the most extraordinary feats of human history was accomplished. Few labors of man have endured as long as these immense monuments, and few mysteries persist as stubbornly as those surrounding their creation. Somehow, more than six million limestone blocks were piled up to 40 stories high to make the three royal tombs of the pharaohs. Incredibly, the entire construction was completed in 70 years. Without modern technology, workers lifted blocks weighing an average of two and a half tons each and put them in place at a rate of one about every two minutes. Who were the people who built the pyramids? How did they accomplish their monumental task? What can their lives tell us about the world that existed in 2500 BC? The recent surge of activity on the Giza Plateau is yielding some dramatic new answers to the ancient puzzle of who built the pharaoh's tombs. 200 years of digging have produced pyramids, tombs, temples, statues, nice inscriptions, and relief scenes, but where were all the people? Mark Lehner is professor of Egyptian archaeology at the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute. His work has helped shift the focus of study here from monuments to men. For the first time, we're excavating to shed some light on the lives of the people, as opposed to just how the elite and the king that they served, how they were buried. Recent discoveries by Lehner and others have turned the popular understanding of pyramid building on its head. For centuries, the pyramid builders were thought to be slaves. Hollywood fed the myth of a captive labor force cringing under the whip. But one day in 1990, a remarkable discovery shattered that myth forever. A new era in the study of the ancient Egyptians began with a tourist riding a horse. A hoof plunged through the vaulted roof of a tomb that was sealed in the time of the pharaohs. Inside was a glimpse of eternity. The vault was coated with richly colored plaster, which began to disintegrate the moment it was exposed to the desert air. But for a brief time, it shone as beautifully as the tomb of a king. But the man buried here was not a king, or even a nobleman. He was a worker. According to Dr. Zahi Hawass, director of the Giza Plateau, the design and construction of this tomb suggest that the man inside was no slave. Because of the size of his tomb, because of the unique shape of the vaulted ceiling, and also because it was cased inside with plaster, then I believe this is the man who was in charge of the whole administration of the workmen. This is the man who want to be sure that all these people live in a good living and they go early in the morning to work and they come by in the sunset and they 
live in the village, and the same time when they die, there is a tomb for everyone. In the months following the discovery of the vaulted tomb, Dr. Hawass and his crews unearthed more than 250 additional graves in the same area. They had found an entire cemetery for workers. The foreman's vaulted tomb is surrounded by the graves of his honored staff. Like the tombs of the pharaohs and noblemen, the workers' graves were probably arranged according to their status. Dr. Hawass found that some tombs displayed hieroglyphic job titles, further proof that the ancient builders of Giza were highly regarded craftsmen. We found here three false doors. Above each one, we found painted stila. We found in the titles of those people, the hieroglyphic inscriptions saying that Kherib Yerius means director of building tombs, and Sahaj Yerius means inspector of building tombs. Okay. During excavation, archaeologists made another discovery that helped confirm the workers' status. Like the kings, the builders saw to it that pieces of art accompanied them in eternity. Detailed engravings, hieroglyphics, and small statues offered a glimpse of how the ancient workers actually looked. Hawass and his crew began to see a more and more vivid portrait of the builders. But nothing prepared them for what they would find next. At last, in the shadow of the pyramids, modern workers come face to face with their ancient predecessors. Forensic study of the remains tells a tale of suffering and sacrifice. Some workers' lives were claimed by labor so grueling it was literally backbreaking. In the study of the bones that we found, most of the men that has been found in the cemetery, they had stress on their back, on the bones of the back, meaning that those people were involved in really moving stones or working in the pyramids or working in the tombs. Archaeology now is not like uh, what you see in King Tut and find gold and gold in King Tut never give us an idea about the people and about how they lived and about anything. But this cemetery is working with the dirt and the sand. Then each piece of sand, each piece of stone, each piece of pottery reconstructs the Egyptian history. It gives us information about those people. Today, Life on the Giza Plateau still moves to the ancient rhythms of the desert. Modern Egyptians work here now, slowly unveiling the lives of their ancestors.
Mohammed Morsi. Andub. Sabah Ali Kamal. Salik Ragel, Yani, Road. A few dozen men report for work at this site today. But during the pyramid construction, there were tens of thousands. Mark Lehner knew that a huge workforce would have required a city to support it. But where was the evidence of this long abandoned metropolis? The first glimpse of it came when excavators began to uncover a bakery. It's as though everywhere we open up a hole in the desert, we find massive evidence of bread baking. And we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of loaves. Where you have so much bread, the beer can't be far away, and where you have bread and beer, you have to have people. So it says that there are a lot of consumers out here. Lehner and his team found huge vats for mixing batter and hundreds of bread molds. We apologize to this pot that's been here for 5,000 years intact. But there's no way we can take it out. Oh. The more the archaeologists revealed, the more familiar the bakery became. They had seen its blueprint before. For years, Egyptologists have relied on the tomb of tea in nearby Saqqara for details about daily life in the time of the pharaohs. Exquisite murals depict a broad range of ancient activities. The illustrations show how the Egyptians brewed beer and how they baked bread in a production line capable of feeding thousands. It matched Lehner's bakery exactly. The beautiful thing about our results here is that the tomb walls inform what we're finding. You can go to this almost like a Sears catalog, like I say, and say, oh yeah, this is what we've got. It's a nice kind of uh, merger of text, picture, and uh, archaeological remains. One fragment at a time, the archaeologists pieced together the layout of the ancient construction site. The desert jealously hides most of the evidence. But some clues are right out in the open, just waiting to be recognized for what they really mean. Until recently, Dr. Lehner drove through this passageway every day without giving it much thought. But when digging revealed that most of the structure was buried in sand, Lehner reconsidered its significance. What appeared to be only a 12-foot ledge was actually a gigantic wall that once towered 30 feet above the desert. Now, you don't build a 26-foot high gateway so men can go to work every day. This is a border, and this is the entrance to something really powerful. And what's really powerful are the pyramids, the tombs, and the temples, the tombs of the elite. And we think that the wall defines a border between all of that, the sacred, the stone, and everything here to the south, which is mud, uh, stone rubble, and the secular support for everything north of the wall. And more and more I'm convinced this was, in fact, downtown Egypt during the time the pyramids were built. The wall separated this downtown area where workers lived from their sacred work site. Through the huge gateway lay a harbor, the center of activity for the entire plateau. At a harbor that's certainly unloading the stone, 
They're unloading the people that they're bringing from the provinces for labor, but they're also unloading all the goods and commodities that came from all those new farms and ranches and cities, towns that were established for feeding the pyramid complex. For the first time, they were gathering people together, not in terms of hundreds, but suddenly in terms of thousands or tens of thousands. To the edge of the desert, these masses came to make burial tombs for their kings, skyscrapers that would dwarf anything yet built by man. The building techniques were ingenious, but mysterious even today. How did workers lift these huge stones 40 stories high? Many scholars believe they used giant ramps that spiraled up the sides of the unfinished pyramid to move the blocks to the top. We would have seen hundreds, if not thousands of men, organized probably into teams of 10 or 20, pulling two and a half ton blocks on large wooden sleds up the long ramp. There would have been a cacophony of sounds. You would have heard the clink a chink of stonemasons cutting the stones, tool sharpeners sharpening the copper chisels, and probably the chanting of thousands of men. They had to be doing this in a real rhythm if they put one block in place every two and a half minutes. Even as a picture of the ancient construction site emerges, another important mystery remains. Where did all this limestone, more than 15 million tons, come from? For centuries, a popular myth held that the stone came from a faraway quarry. But Dr. Lehner suspected there had to be a much closer source. For insights, he looked to a modern quarry, where limestone cutting goes on pretty much as it did in 2500 BC. Quarrymen dig long channels as a first step in breaking out giant limestone blocks. If channel marks like these could be found near the pyramids, they'd pinpoint a closer source of stone. Back at Giza, just 300 yards from the base of the largest pyramid, Lehner found what he was looking for the telltale shape of a channel. You can actually see the, the, uh, the quarry man's pick mark in, in vertical striations coming down. And he was in here probably alone with lots of dust and chips flying all over the place with his pick, hacking his way through this giant rectangle of limestone bedrock. Finally, Dr. Lehner had some proof. The stone came from right here a quarry within sight of the Great Pyramids. And you can see one edge of the quarry over there, the rock uh, edge, just showing above these massive piles of debris. And if you draw a circle with your eye around the horizon and come over to this sheer rock face, that's the entire outline of the Khufu quarry. The amount of stone missing equals the amount of stone in the Pyramid of Khufu, and the sides of the quarry line up with the Khufu Pyramid. Generations missed the quarry because it was filled in with strange debris. Lehner believes this rubble is all that's left of the pyramid construction ramps. When their work was finished, the builders tore down the ramps and dumped the remains here in the quarry. We're looking at what the pyramid ramps were built out of, just piles and piles of this limestone dust. And then they put up a retaining wall of mud and clay. And this stuff as a whole, you know, is extremely solid. But when you want to take it apart, it really comes apart nicely with a pick and into its constituent parts. So this is essentially what the pyramid ramps must have been built out of because this is what's here. Tons, millions of tons of this stuff. Even 
even as we solve the mysteries of how the tombs of the three pharaohs were constructed, scientists and laymen alike are still in awe of the scope of this ancient undertaking. Mark Lehner's discoveries here may help put to rest some of the more far-fetched theories. It's, for me, much more mysterious and intriguing that the culture ruled by Khufu, Khafre, and Menkari built these rather than some cop-out, you know, which is what, you know, the extraterrestrial option is. It's a cop-out. Well, we don't know how they did it. It was built by somebody else. Um, first of all, it's sort of colonialist to say that somebody else, some other civilization that's missing, built them. But also, I think it really, it really doesn't tap the human mystery of how they were built with so much suffering, with so much dedication, um, by the people that we know lived here, by the people in the tombs that were buried around here, by the people who were making bread down in our bakery. The ancient Egyptians expressed devotion to their kings with their labor and their lives. Today, thanks to the work of Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass, we have an idea of what the plateau looked like when the monuments were new. You entered the pyramid from the valley temple a quarter of a mile down from the base of the pyramid. You went up this long covered corridor which had a narrow shaft of light coming in. It was very dim and it was dark. And all of a sudden, you emerged onto this open courtyard, which was paved with white alabaster. And your eyes by now were very used to the darkness. You came out to this blinding light off this white alabaster floor. You were surrounded by these colossal statues of the king that were in this dazzling light. I'm sure it was very inspiring on a national level. Though the work here is far from over, the University of Chicago team must head home until next year. For both the Americans and the Egyptians, it has been an extraordinary season of discovery. As these workers celebrate what they've accomplished, they join in spirit the stonemasons and architects of antiquity. The next age of explorers will marvel at the work of ancient and 20th century craftsmen alike. Tens of thousands of workers have passed through here and each has left a mark on eternity.